So uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, show in this second lecture that there is a connection between the parity conditions imposed at spatial infinity or parity twisted boundary conditions that we imposed at spatial infinity and the so-called matching conditions that Schrödinger is using connecting the past of future, future null infinity with the future of past null infinity. And of course this is not a surprise because if you want to go from one to the other somehow you have to go through spatial infinity. But so I would like to blow up spatial infinity and see how it connects more precisely than what I said in the first lecture with past null infinity and future null infinity. So let me ma make the question a bit more explicit. So if you consider, for instance, the bondy form of the metric at a future null infinity, one usually assumes such an expansion. Um, I will comment actually, I will well, argue that extra terms have to be included later, but let's not discuss that now. So this is what one takes. At, null, at future null infinity, one takes a similar expansion at past null infinity and one assumes some connection between, uh, let's say, this coefficient m here and this coefficient m here, for, for instance. So for, uh, to be more precise, so these are what, these are typically one type of matching conditions. Uh, one assumes that the past limit of the function m, the, which is a bondy mass which appears in at future null infinity is equal to the future limit of the bondy mass which appears in the expansion at past null infinity. And similar connections are made between some other coefficients appearing in the metric. Now, And why is this x and minus x? Is yeah, so there is this, uh, it involves an antipodal uh, match. I, I will explain actually. Okay. This is the way he derived it. Well, you, it's it's in a sense because you are going through the origin, but I will, I will actually, it will come out that way. Uh, I will explain. So that was a bit surprising. Indeed, you have to match things with the minus x. So you have to, that's why you have to, in the matching conditions involve the antipodal map. And well, that was a way to get conservation law. So we had to do things like that. But I think, that, but the question I, I would like to ask is, can we justify these conditions. Now, what does that mean by justify? Well, in a sense, we should give reasonable initial data and then ask the question, I will evolve this initial data, I will get something at null infinity, I will, inv well, in principle, if I could integrate explicitly, I will do the same, I will get something at past null infinity and then do I g do the metric that I obtain at past null infinity and the metric that I obtain at future null infinity obey this condition. So I, I would like to view that as some question, dynamical question. I give you the initial data. Will the Strominger matching conditions be fulfilled? Okay, this is exactly, of course, you have to say within what, which class. Hmm? Okay, so you, you have to specify the initial data. But so if they are reasonable, in particular if they obey the initial conditions that I gave you uh, in the first lecture, will that or fulfill the, boundary con the matching conditions of Strominger? Also actually there are some smoothness conditions which are assumed in the sense, uh, in the sense that some Subleading log r over r squared or log r over r cube, etc., term are not included in the original Bondi expansion, but I think that thanks to Thibault we know that we, they should be present. You must ask if I take initial data, I evolve them, will I get a metric which fits the Bondi metric or will I get extra terms that I should <coughs> take into account? Okay. Now you can actually ask the same questions in Minkowski space. What people working at null infinity do, but that's simp uh, for for the Maxwell field in Minkowski space, and that's simpler because you have a fixed uh, background geometry. So um, you can say, well, I give you initial data for the electromagnetic field, and I see how they develop at null infinity and past uh, future null infinity, past null infinity, and I compare. So more precisely, people have assumed that near 
fusional infinity, we have such an expansion for the Maxwell field. I only show one, co one component, FUR. The same, so yeah, maybe my notation, but that was... So XA are, are the angles, theta phi. Uh, actually not theta phi, because I, I'm assuming that the antipodal map reverses the sign. So it's... Uh, but so by the minus sign means the antipodal map. Uh, and this is personal infinity, and then they are con can we connect that to that? And Strominger is using such a connection. He is assuming that, for instance, uh, the past limit of that function is connected to the future limit of that function in that way, again with the antipodal map. Now, you can, you can verify that on some known solution this indeed holds, but you might ask the question, if I take general initial data compatible with Hamiltonian consistency, for instance, will I obtain such uh, expansions, fulfilling these matching conditions. Now, clearly to do that, you need to understand what happens at spatial infinity. Hmm? So I, I recall the Penrose diagram. So what we are interested in is we, are, we have the fields here, we have the fields here, we are taking limits as we go to that point, from the past null infinity, we go to the future of it, or we go to the past of future null infinity, and we want, want to match, but clearly to match that, we have to go through I0. And of course, it's a very bad uh, coordinate system uh, or representation uh, to analyze what is happening at I0. I will discuss that uh, in a second. But so before, before discussing it, this, this is what we want to do, okay? To compare what happens here with what happens as you go to the past year. Now, actually, you can even ask the question in an even more simple context, which is a scalar field. So you can, ag again, people have looked at scalar fields in four-dimensional Minkowski space, so when they assume some null infinity expansion, and the same at so this is future null infinity, past null infinity, and then there is some connection that is being, uh, that you could uh, impose between, so this would be the analog of the matching conditions. Now, why is the scalar field simpler? Well, because there is no problem of gauge invariance, because when you want to match, well, of course, I, I wrote the matching in terms of F for electromagnetism, this is gauge invariant, but if you want to match other components uh, of the vector potential, you have always the issue of in which gauge should I do the matching. Maybe if I don't get the matching in one gauge, I would get a different matching in another gauge. For the scalar field, no such. If you want the, the matching either old or doesn't, I mean, there is no problem of gauge invariance. So I will do it first for the scalar field. But you have cancelled the phi zero, the wave. Yes. Yes, let's... Sorry? But that will be... Sorry? Angle dependent wave. Okay. Yes, this I have uh, not taken here because uh, for reasons I will explain. But indeed, one should perhaps enlarge the formalism to allow such a, an angle dependent uh, and see what, what happens. Let me take that restricted because this is really, there is no such wav for f or for the, for the metric, so uh, for, for, for f at least. For, <laughs> for the metric we know what it is, <laughs> we think. <laughs> okay, so, okay, probably what can improve, but we can ask a question here, okay? Um, so, what is the equation of motion for a scalar field? Well, it's Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, as I said, no gauge invariance to be worried about, so it's, the comparison is simple. We don't have to worry about uh, gauge frame. And uh, the question I want to ask is how, if I give you initial condition on the scalar field, will they evolve into a scalar field at null infinity that follow, that obeys these conditions? So I have to tell you what is the behavior I have to uh, allow for the scalar field, and since I want the action to be finite, and I will take the scalar field to go like 1 over r, now this is at, uh, along uh, on space-like hypersurfaces, uh, well, again, yeah, I'm expressing, well, I don't know why I said that, this it was already implicit before, 
But uh, yeah, it's just to tell you that I will introduce later gamma bar AB, which is a metric on the unit sphere. So, uh, okay, so this is a round metric. And XA, so these coefficients can depend on the angles as previously and on time. And uh, I want to integrate the equations of motion, so I have to tell you also what is phi dot, because this is a second order uh, equation, uh, Klein Gordon, with respect to time. Or equivalently, I have to tell you what the conjugate momentum is, which is what I will do because I will work Hamiltonian. So in Hamiltonian form, the action reads uh, pi phi dot, where pi is a conjugate momentum, no gauge invariance, no constraint, no Lagrange multiplier, and this is the energy density. And I will assume asymptotically, well, not only that phi goes as 1 over r, but that the momentum goes as 1 over r squared. But if I do that, again, I will find a divergence, a logarithmic divergence in the kinetic term, 1 over r squared, 1 over r, so this is 1 over r cubed, r squared dr over r cubed, so I get a, again dr over r, logarithmic divergence, unless I impose some restrictions, and I will pose strict parity conditions. Well, normally I should impose parity conditions up to a twist given by a gauge transformation, but there is no gauge transformation, so zero twist, strict parity conditions. So I will impose that, just as we did for gravity, that the field, the Qs are even to leading order, pi bar are odd to leading order, and you can show that this is preserved by Lorentz transformations. Okay, so... <coughs> okay. So, I want to integrate the Klein-Gordon equation for phi with this initial condition, and pi is essentially pi dot, phi dot. Okay, so I want to integrate. Now, useful coordinates in which to integrate are the so-called hyperbolic coordinates which people have introduced, I think, well, a long time ago already, people have introduced in general relativity. And they are very useful here because the klein gordon equation will separate order by order in the expansion in one over radial distance in hyperbolic coordinates. So what are the hyperbolic coordinates? Well, I will introduce, well, that's why they are called hyperbolic. I will introduce uh, eta defined by, so eta equal to constant correspond to an hyperbolic, hyperboloid t uh, minus t squared plus r squared equal to constant, so I will assume this positive, so that means that I'm in the region r greater than t. I will introduce this uh, uh, new time variable s t over r. This is invertible in that region. This is the inverse transformation. But what and, well, the metric, well, this is a standard computation. You can rewrite the metric in these hyperbolic coordinates. It becomes, uh, well, a familiar form, so you get delta squared, where eta is this radial parameter. Uh, S plays the role of time, but with my definitions, here is the form of the metric in these coordinates on the hyperboloid. So, on, on eta equal to constant is an hyperboloid, that's why, hence the name. Okay, so why is it useful? Well, it's useful for two reasons. First of all, it gives a much better description of spatial infinity. You remember that in the Con Penrose compactification, uh, sorry, of spatial infinity. Spatial infinity is a single point, and to discuss the evolution of, at spatial infinity, it's of course not appropriate, so this blows up spatial infinity. And so that will be b very good because this is we want to be able to integrate using smooth equations of motion. So, and another good thing is that uh, the equations separate order by order. So let me show that. So first of all, this is what it covers. So it, on it only covers that part of the Penrose diagram, the red region. Okay. So in terms of uh, so the, you see that the retarded time here uh, actually is always negative huh, because this is retarded time equal to zero and here smaller value. So, and this is retarded time goes to minus infinity so just to 
that will be useful for later. But this is the part that it covers, but that's enough because we are interested in this region. Okay, so the good thing is that, as I said, is that it resolves spatial infinity in the following sense. If you go to infinity along a space-like radial straight line, and you go to R goes to infinity, well, the hyperbolic coordinates will approach, oops, sorry. So this, so I, I look at that uh, line, which is space-like, so uh, A is smaller <coughs> than 1 in absolute values, and you take the limit, R goes to infinity, well, it's clear that the ratio, which is S, of R over, of T over R, will take, will go to a limiting value, which is a, and so you can distinguish the various uh, space-like radial line by the asymptotic value of A. Okay, so the angle that they make, you see, in this representation, they all go here. But by blowing that up, you, are, uh, you can differentiate between the different uh, straight lines according to the value of A. Okay, which is, so it's better from that point of view. And actually, you can, uh, as A goes to 1, clearly you go to a, either uh, if a plus 1 is t equal r, so it's a, a light ray uh, going, uh, going outwards, or uh, so, you, and so when you take the limit S goes to 1, you are reaching the past of future null infinity from spatial infinity. And this is the type of thing that we want to, to study precisely. And the other limit which correspond to S goes to minus 1. Okay, now, that's one good thing. Another good feature of hyperbolic coordinates is that if you look at the equation of motion for phi, so I've written it in, in this uh, coordinate system, um, introducing a covariant derivative on, with this, on the hyperboloid, so with respect to this metric on the hyperboloid, it's clear that the slice s equal to 0, s e is equal to t over r, so s equal to 0 is t equal to 0. It, co it coincides with the Cauchy hyperplanes, so we are going to try a solution which has the following asymptotic expansion, so that will reduce when s equal to 0 to the expansion that we have considered. So we are considering inverse power of eta, eta plays now the role of radial coordinates, with power starting at 1 over eta. So k equal to 0 is eta minus 1. Okay, so I will find, we'll try to find solutions of that equation which have the following expansion. Now, why is this something that you can do? It's because when you insert, you find that the equations decouple order by order in k, so k being the power of 1 over eta. So each coefficient here, which is a function of s and of the angle, will obey independent equations for different value of k. And of course, we are especially interested in k equals 0, which means 1 over eta. Yes, yeah, asymptotic means asymptotic in time. Where do I use? No, so asymptotic for very large value of eta. Of eta. Of the eta, which is still the analog of, so on t equals 0, that will be the same as a uh, large value of r, but on the other slice, which are not hyperplanes, uh, I will look at uh, so a large value of, uh, well, they are cones, the other slice, because, I mean, the coordinate system is that you have uh, t equal to 0 is the hyperplane, and then an S, uh, S, so S, that's also S equal to 0, and S uh, different from 0, you would have a light cone, but uh, you would have a cone, sorry, which is space-like until s equal to 1, which is a light cone. Because it's t equal a r. Okay, so that's what I meant by asymptotic. So this is close to eta equal infinity. So we have equations that decouple, and I think, well, I think many people have done this computation, So I, and it's really straightforward technique. You just... Uh, write them explicitly, and here is what you get. And uh, because they decouple each other, you just can analyze them separately. And uh, I will first look at k equal to zero. But before doing that, for all of them, you can 
solve them using, of course, a spherical harmonics. So you would expand uh, the function, the coefficient, which is a function of s and x, like this. This factor, this factor being included in order to get equations that you can easily identify. This is, there is nothing really mysterious here, but uh, it's just that it simplifies the form of the equation, or at least makes it identifiable. Now, equation for what? Well, the unknown here is the, are the coefficients of the various spherical harmonics, which are functions of s, which is uh, the time coordinate on the hyperboloid. Okay? So I have to look at what the equation is, and here it is. And for k equal to zero, so we, you, we can clearly solve. These are, uh, I guess, Nugobar equations. So these are uh, equations which are in the literature. But for k equal to zero, they are particularly simple because you get the Legendre, I think, the Legendre equation, differential equation. Okay, this is the equation, and this equation is well known, and so we have. The Legendre, first of all, it's, a, it's an equation with Fuchsian singularities at s equal 1 and at s equal minus 1, which corresponds here to uh, these two, so the future of past null infinity and the past of future null infinity. So this is precisely where we want to do the matching, to, to, to say, say something about the matching, I should say. Okay, now, one of the solutions to that equation is actually smooth even at s equal plus minus at the singular points. These are the Legendre polymo polynomials. Okay. And then the other solution is the uh, Legendre function of the second kind, which is not smooth. It's not polynomial. It has a logarithmic singularity. Well, I had to, to refresh my memory because I had, I had seen that as an undergraduate student, but I had forgotten. So, um, trust me that indeed, well, we have the Legendre polynomial. That is so probably the thing which is. Sorry? It's PL1 up. It's a Gegenbauer. Yeah, I'm using a different uh, a notation of Gegenbauer, but this is really the Legendre. Uh, I think so, yes. That with my notation, one half is Legendre. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, okay, I think that notation had some rationale for us, but okay, I, I forgot. Now, the Legendre polynomial are regular, and so the general solution at order zero will then be, uh, will be a, a linear combination of this thing with some coefficient and of the singular solution, which is a logarithmic singularity with some other coefficient. Now, as we know, the, well, they are polynomials, so they are clearly finite as s goes to the to null infinity, so plus or minus, so future null infinity plus one, minus <coughs> null infinity minus one, minus, uh, sorry, past null infinity minus one. Um, so this term has no singularity. Well, of course, there is this goes to zero in any case, so we will have to check, but, but this term has a logarithmic singularity. And in fact, it's well known how these Legendre functions diverge close to the singular point. We can express them in terms of the L equal to zero solution, some the Legendre polynomials themselves, and then some polynomials of order uh, lower, if I... But the singularity is in the first term. Okay, uh, where is... A, okay, that's what Q0 is. Okay, so there is some logarithmic divergence at s equal 1 and s equal minus 1 coming from here, and there is some smooth uh, behavior there. Now, one thing that I have to add, and that's particularly important for the um, uh, matching conditions, is that we know that these two independent solutions have two different parity properties when s goes into minus s. Uh, in the sense that the Legendre polynomial PL is as a parity minus 1 to the L, and the Legendre function of the second kind of, uh, as the opposite parity. So when one is even, the other is odd. When, is, when one is odd, the other is even. 
but they are multiplied by uh, the spherical harmonics, which have also some definite parity property under the antipodal map. Actually, in that case, the same as PL, I mean, if which means that if I take this product <coughs> and I accompany the uh, switch between S to minus S, and ultimately it will be the switch between future null infinity and past null infinity, S minus 1 will be compared with S equal to 1, and at the same time I make the antipodal map, I get something which is unchanged, I mean plus sign. While if I do that for the other solution, because there is a mismatch by one, so this will be even for that simultaneous uh, change of S into minus S and antipodal map, this one will have the opposite parity. Um, okay, now note that if S is equal to zero, which was my initial surface, this, reduce S, this reduces to the antipodal map I was considering on spatial, sp on spatial hypersurfaces. But as I move S to non-zero value, this is connecting uh, in the limit S goes to 1, null infinity future with null infinity past. Okay. Now, so the, what I, I will call the solution involving P the P branch, the solution involving Q the Q branch, the P branch is even, the Q branch is odd. Now, it turns out I will be rather quick here, but so let me first express the idea. It turns out that the hyperbolic coordinates are very good because they blow up spatial infinity, but to study the connection between spatial infinity with null infinity, they are not very good, because actually they give a bad description on, of null infinity. Let me explain that, the hyperbolic coordinates. So we have to do better. That's, and do better means use coordinates introduced by Friedrich, which I will explain, but first let me explain the problem, and then let me tell you how it is solved. So in hyperbolic coordinates, we have seen that null infinity, or at least this point, as a value s equal to 1, and this point s equal to minus 1, but actually n rho, of course, is, minus is, uh, is uh, plus infinity, but it turns out that the entire portion of infinity described by the hyperbolic coordinates has the same s equal to plus 1 and uh, eta, sorry, not rho, goes to infinity. Maybe you can draw the, the original lines where going this and then plunging there, no? you could... That would be the space like hypersurface. Yeah, but the other ones are more like, uh, yeah, they, they, plunge. they plunge in, in this coordinate system, they plunge. And that's why they, uh, you see, but yeah, that's why they, you have a bad description. So in other, another way to see this, suppose I take a, I want to go to null infinity, so I go to infinity along a null line, a radial null geodesic, where t is equal to r plus b. Well, you can just look at the transformation formula between t, r, and eta, and s. Always eta will go to infinity, and always, no matter what is b, t, uh, s will go to 1. And if you take uh, t, 1 going in the opposite uh, direction with a, min uh, with a minus sign, it will be always eta goes to plus infinity, and s goes to minus 1. So you cannot identify which point, I mean, in this coordinate system, you cannot distinguish these points here. So what, somehow you have gained something at null infinity, but you have lost something at null infinity. Sorry, you have gained something at spatial infinity, I'm not sure I said it right, but you have lost something at null infinity. And these coordinates introduced by Friedrich, they not only keep the blowing of spatial infinity, but they are also such, such that null infinity, uh, you can distinguish points on null infinity, okay? So they are adapted to study the passage from spatial infinity to null infinity, okay? That I think it and was... In Schmidt, we are not using the Friedrich... I think they were using only hyperbolic. Okay. Friedrich came later or independently and they went... Sorry? 
Helmut, yeah, Helmut. Okay, so this, now the new coordinates, Helmut Friedrich were led to them by some construction, which I'm not going to explain. Let me just give them to you. So they are not, they, uh, so you keep S as it is. So future null infinity will still be S equal to plus one. Past null infinity will still be S equal to minus one. But the other coordinate uh, has a more subtle uh, behavior, which you can see. You are introducing, in fact, this factor that goes to zero when you go to null infinity. So that's a way to blow uh, null infinity. And um, so in these coordinates, here is how the metric reads. Well, it doesn't perhaps tell you much, but let me just say a few properties of this metric. Well, it's conformal to what I've written in the parentheses, clearly, which is that metric. It's not but they, that's the price to pay if you want to blow up both spatial infinity and null infinity. There is a cross term, so it's not diagonal. Now you see null infinity, uh, uh, spatial infinity will still be at row goes to plus infinity. S be between minus one and one. Okay, so this is what we said, so this is kept. And actually, when you do that, you see that uh, when rho is constant, so the metric induced on rho is equal to constant, is just the metric on the cylinder. Okay, if I set rho equal to constant and then take the limit, rho goes to infinity, I will get the metric on the cylinder. But, uh, so this is just what I said, but if you, as you go now to null infinity, this new coordinate row will take different values according to where you hit null infinity. Because this parameter b, which I had written, you keep the memory of it when in these new coordinates. So this is a good thing. This is what you have to remember. Uh, I'm not going to explicitly do the transformation, but the idea is that you now have a, a good coordinate system where you can distinguish points at null infinity and also points at spatial infinity. So the idea is that you they still describe the same region, but we have a better thing because now uh, S and rho, the new coordinates, rho goes from uh, zero to infinity, here also, and so you can distinguish, and this has been blown up, which you don't see on the Penrose diagram, but uh, uh, which I explained. Okay, but the same region is covered. So now we will, to, to study the transition, we will express the field in Friedrich coordinate, and then actually I will go to Bondi coordinates, advanced and retarded to compare. Um, so if you do the expansion, well, this is a just technical point, so maybe I don't have to spend too much time on it. But so I w the idea is that you want to go to null infinity, so you take the limit s go to plus or minus one, keeping rho fixed, and then you can take rho goes to infinity if you want to compare with spatial, in with spatial infinity. So, but maybe the fastest way to proceed is to directly, in that expansion, go to Bondi null coordinates, u and r, okay? So if you expand, this is what you find for s, this is what you find for rho, and then you will take the limit u goes to minus infinity. Okay, so since you will take the limit u goes to minus infinity, which is where you want to compare the fields, uh, I can as well assume from the very beginning that u is negative, which is probably what I have assumed already in some of these expansions. Okay, now you expand the field in these coordinates u and r. And, well, the field you know contains uh, the q branch and the p branch. The p branch is polynomial in S, but the q branch has logarithmic uh, terms. So now you rewrite them in terms of u and r. Okay, and I skip the technical part. Let's look at the result. Now, as I said, q, so q will I approximate uh, near null infinity will be the argument is 1 plus u over r. Mm? That was, sorry, I just replaced s by its value. So now I have q by its value. And I'm interested in uh, u goes to minus infinity. 
And I, I, well, I want to expand in powers of r. I want to look at the term which is 1 over r, the coefficient of the 1 over r term, and see what happens. Now, if you expand, what do you get? Well, because there is a logarithm, actually, you don't get just an expansion in the inverse power of r. You get also logarithmic terms, okay, coming from this second solution, independent solution. Excuse me. The, uh, Q0 itself looks like a hyperbolic distance. No? Yes, that's right. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. It's a, I guess it's a familiar function in many contexts. I'm not sure that. Uh, well, actually, we are also on the hyperboloid, so uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because s yes, it will be the distance. Okay. Oops. And so the singularities from that point of view are not uh, okay. So let me again. So I guess this is really uh, direct material, huh? um, but you see that interesting thing is that first of all the Q branch, at least the lead, which I'm looking only at the leading term huh? coming. Remember I said k equal to zero, but we see that the Q branch will bring. If I expand that, uh, I will get well that. Okay, which means that I have a logarithm of r. So in, in my expansion in terms of 1 over r, I will get a term log r over r. But then I will have also a 1 over r terms, but which is coupled, which, which will come with a set, well, the coefficient minus 1, whatever, uh, log minus u. So which will also blow up when u goes to minus infinity. So if you as people do assume that there is no log r over r term, you have to impose that this q branch is absent. Because actually each term in the q branch, I, everything can be related to q0 and with a coefficient which, I mean, we just keep the leading value of the coefficient which is non-zero. So all the term with different values of L will come with this singularity an independent coefficient. So if you want this singularity to be absent, you have to set all the Q's, uh, set a Q the equal to zero. Okay. Can I ask a question? But I thought that we didn't want to assume at the very beginning what's going to happen to our community. That's right. So I will, okay, I will, I will do both. I will, at the same time, if we want to avoid the logarithmic term, we have to set all the coefficient theta equal to zero, q equal to zero. If we don't do that, there will be some extra term in the expansion besides the 1 over r or 1 over r squared or whatever term. There will be also log r over r term. So initial data without log r over r term will nevertheless develop into scalar field solution near null infinity, which involves log r over r. Now, either you say, I don't like them and I restrict my initial conditions, or you say we live with them and you don't restrict your initial conditions. Now I'm saying that at least here I will restrict the initial condition because recall I wanted to have to impose parity condition on my initial data for entirely different reasons. I wanted the action to be finite. One way to achieve that was to impose parity condition. And as we have seen the parity condition are precise, well, on s equal to zero the parity condition is precisely, I mean, this, con this parity of the Q's and, and the P, of the Q branch and the P branch, we remember the P branch is even, the Q branch is odd. If I look at S equal to zero, the P branch will give me something which obey my parity condition, the Q branch will, be obey something, will give me something which do not, does not obey my parity condition. So at least from the Hamiltonian point of view, it's natural to impose this parity condition, at least on this order. This, I think, is what I said. So, if you are someone living at null infinity, not liking log r over r, you set that equal to zero, but I'm saying there is a good argument to do it. It comes from the Hamiltonian formalism and the parity conditions. But that is not... And then also, because we are keeping only the p branch, the p branch is even under the combined hyperbolic transformation in which you reverse s into minus s and x into minus x. So if you combine the connection, I mean, if you go from 
future null infinity to past null infinity and at the same time make the antipodal map, you will obey, I mean, you will derive that relationship. And so you are justifying the matching conditions that people impose in the scalar field case. Okay? Now, however, I, okay, that's, that's for result k for k equal to zero. What about higher values of k? Now, other values of k, we have no reason to impose parity conditions because uh, <coughs> they don't, I mean, they, they don't <coughs> make the action inf diverge because they are correspond to 1 over r squared. However, if you integrate the equation and you uh, go to null infinity, you can show that they will introduce log r over r terms, uh, sorry, log r over r squared terms, log r over r cubed terms, okay? But these will not invalidate the matching conditions which, which are given on the leading contribution. Nothing is said about the matching of the, and it better be so, about the subleading terms. They are given uh, only about the leading terms, which actually view, in the case of Strominger, view the charge, the conserved charges, so it's fine. But let me go. But it's important to recall that there will be logarithmic terms coming from k equal 1, k equal 2, etc. And you have this situation that even if they decay as 1 over r squared at spatial infinity, well, if it represents a wave, maybe it's not surprising, you could have something which is uh, at null infinity. Well, it cannot reach spatial infinity, but it can go to null infinity and be something that uh, <coughs> goes as log r over r squared. Actually, they don't invalidate the matching conditions really for two reasons, because there might be contributions to 1 over r, but they vanish in the limit u goes to minus infinity. You see, you, you might have waves here, but as you, as you go to here, the extra terms that might appear go away, in any case. Because, uh, just as, okay. Because you see, uh, there, is a log, there, is a one over, there is a 1 over r, not only do you have log r over r, but you have also log u over r. So from the point of view of the expansion, it gives a 1 over r contribution. It's fine from the point of view of the expansion in powers of r, but uh, this is divergent. And so you are doing, by eliminating this, you are eliminating the, and not only the log r over r terms, but also the log minus u over r term, which would uh, diverge. Now you can show that the other k equal 1, k equal 2, etc., might bring uh, powers of r, inverse powers of r, but they vanish in that case in, in the limit. Okay, so they don't invalidate the conclusion. Ah, oh, this, <laughs> this time I, <laughs> I was quick. <laughs> okay, but let me say then in words, okay, that will be in the conclusion. So, First of all, for the scalar field, things are very simple, and we can integrate the initial conditions to get and justify from initial conditions obeying some parity conditions um, <coughs> the matching conditions that assume that null infinity. Okay? This is what I said. Uh, as I said also, there might be subdominant logarithmic term which will generically appear, and if you really want to kill them, you would need an infinite number. I mean, at each order of 1 over r, you would have to, to impose a condition, some parity condition. So that's probably not something you want to do. But what we see, and that's interesting, is that the matching conditions assumed between the past of future null infinity and the future of past null infinity are consequences of the parity conditions fulfilled by the initial data. And it's not completely surprising because if I, you see, if I, well, I will do it in two dimensions. So if you work on space-like hypersurfaces, hyper you can show that the parity conditions are Lorentz invariant. So if the fields obey parity conditions here, they will obey parity conditions here, and they will obey parity conditions here. And so if you go to an infinite, if you infinitely boost, these hyperplanes will tend to be like that. And so parity conditions at the future here will be related to parity conditions. I mean, you will relate things to in the future to things in the past. So this is probably not too surprising and, and, and is justified. Now, indeed, the inter I mean, the interesting question is what about 
the other fields. So electromagnetism can be handled and the parity condition that I showed on the electromagnetic field can be justified from parity conditions that you impose on the, um, on the initial data. And there, actually, if you re really want to be as general as possible, you have to impose parity conditions up to a gauge transformation. Now, for the electromagnetic field, it doesn't matter because it's, it's invariant under large gauge transformations as well. But there are other fields that are connected by matching conditions, notably the, the analog of the shear, but there is something like that that plays the same role, memory which, which would appear in the electromagnetic memory according to uh, people studying electromagnetic memory. That field is not... Sabrina. Sorry? Sabrina, okay. Yeah, yes, among, yeah. So they are also, this also needs some matching conditions and you can derive them from the initial condition. So the same reasoning that the matching conditions follow from parity conditions on space-like hypersurfaces, where you have to understand parity up to a gauge transformation, which is of a specific class because the formalism remains to be finite, okay, uh, will justify the, the matching conditions assumed for electromagnetism. And for gravity, it's a bit more, it's more complicated because the equations are more complicated and you have to play with gauge conditions if you want to match beyond, you can do the matching for the veil tensor without asking too many questions. At asymptotically, it's like it's a, it will be gauge invariant, so uh, without asking too much questions about gauge coordinate choices. But if you want to match things like the shear, what is the value of C here compared with the value of C here, which Strominger is also, also assuming, this can be related to the parity conditions that we had for the functions U and V. You remember that U was odd or even, I forgot, and V was of the opposite parity. They combine to form a function, but you can show that the functions that they will form here will be antipodally matched according to what Strominger has assumed with the functions that you form here. So all this to say that you can justify the matching conditions which have been assumed from integrating initial data fulfilling appropriate parity conditions. So with that, uh, I will, I guess, uh, close. So I was long the first one, but I am here at 5.30. <laughs> Thank you. Questions or comments? No questions on the first talk that people <laughs> didn't <laughs> <days to have. laughs> ask. I had a question. First of all, thank you for the uh, talk. And how, maybe it's naive, but how does this situation change we consider Einstein, so gravity, plus other things, so let's say Maxwell or... Uh, okay, Einstein, Maxwell, you would have a... All other uh, matter fields, let's say. Okay, so if the matter field is... Uh, Without gauge invariance, you will just have the BMS group. If the matter field has also its own gauge invariances, you expect, the, um, for instance, Einstein-Maxwell, you would have BMS, but then you will also have uh, angle-dependent U1 transformations, and the full group of asymptotic symmetries will be the not really the direct sum, because on the U1 transformation, Lorentz act, you get a non-trivial representation, so it's. Uh, but apart from that, it's well, it's morally a direct term. So they just combine. And um, maybe this is also naive, but uh, how um, these asymptotic symmetries uh, uh, relate on how should we classify our asymptotic states? When okay, so this is an, the next step, I think, which has not been very much developed, which is to study the representations of the BMS group. Now, I think that, and there have been some debate, I mean, there have been some work, very complete work by mathematicians a long time ago, but I think that this has been questioned because the assumptions made on the functional spaces on which, you know, you have in infinite dimensional algebra, so it's, uh, were maybe not realized in, 
or not not expected to be realized in practical situations. So I think there are still there is still work to be done on the representation of the BMS group. But I would say that in a in a in the new reformulation in which we have been able to decouple super translate algebraically super translations from Poincaré, I should think that the discussion of representation should be simpler because we have the representation of Poincaré and we take the tensor product of the representations of the super translation of the pure super translations. But this should be done. It has not been done, been done so far, to my knowledge so far. Because I think that in this case uh in the couple, the two. Yeah, and it looks like uh, an infinite dimensional Heisenberg algebra. You have, yeah. Mm, uh, numbers and then uh, other. Uh. Yeah, so I think you would have the quantum numbers of uh, irreducible representation of Poincaré, which we know, and uh, extra internal quantum numbers related to the representations of the super translations. Yes? Did you do uh, the matching between uh, past and future null, null infinity uh, with the alternate um, parity conditions and rules that are uh, equivalent to parity? But uh... okay, so yes, because actually that's important for quantities like the shear, which is not invariant under diffeomorphism. I mean, it's under large diffeomorphism. So it's important to, to, to go beyond uh, strictly gauge invariant quantities. So we did, yes, we, we can justify. We can justify the assumptions that people made that uh, C, the limit of C, as C goes to U, to minus C, as C is a function of U. Its limit as U goes to minus infinity is antipodic, antipodally related to its limit as v goes to plus infinity, which was one of the conditions assumed by Strominger, actually to have conservation of the BMS charges. What should we think of super rotations? No people who okay. use generalizations yes. of BMS. Okay. I think that's an important question. In the Hamiltonian formalism, we have not been able to describe Super rotations. Which are, well, they are singular on the sphere, no? Or that is one thing. But then people have said, well, maybe we should not look at uh, super rotations. We can. People have also looked at, for instance, at diffeomorphism of the sphere with, with unit volume. Then there is no singularity. Diffeomorphism of the sphere. You have gauge fixed or what? Well, we have not. We, so we try to gauge and fix. I mean, assume that indeed we have gauge fix. You say, well, let's gauge and fix and just add terms in the back and, uh, and see whether there are non-zero charges. We have something worse than that. I mean, we can only, because when we gauge unfix, the kinetic term in the action diverges. Ah. And we have not been able to find boundary conditions that still keep the formalism finite. And so from that point of view, we have not been able to include super rotations or generalization of super rotations which there are two possibilities. Either that means that there are not really symmetries or that means that we have not been uh, good enough. You never know. <laughs> you see, when we looked at the BMS group first, we didn't never thought about the logarithmic super translations that you might say it's a bit strange to include. I can tell you historically why. We, we, we were not motivated by the problem I explained to introduce logarithmic super translation. We were motivated by something completely different. If you go to five dimensions, you can also do some BMS group, but you can see it's bigger. And you can see that diffeomorphism of order 1 over r and of order 1 over r squared becomes relevant, non-vanishing charge. If you go to six dimensions, it's 1 over r and 1 over r cubed. But if you go to four, the two collide. And very, very often, when two solutions collide, and don't, are not independent anymore, it, it screams for a logarithm. And so that's why we tried logarithmic super translation for, completely, for reasons completely independent from uh, super, rotation, super translation ambiguities of the angular momentum. By the way, maybe the names of Bondi, Metzner, and Sachs should be pronounced. BMS <laughs> means Bondi. Oh, I didn't say it. Never, Never wrote it either. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it's so well known. Let's say. That, that you are right. Okay, but yeah, there are some when it becomes a classic, yes. people tend to forget. Yeah, it's like ADM or BRST or. <laughs> but it's true that the young generations might forget, might not even know what the names are. Yeah, sorry. Hmm. More questions, comments? No, let's thank again. Thank you.